So I've been interested in this topic, topic for a while. I'll start explaining what the setting is. So throughout this talk, we are going to be working on a compact real analytics surface. And I'm asking real analytics just uh, so that all the results that I'm going to be talking about be easier to present, okay? So that's the setting. And uh, delta is the Laplace operator, if you're not familiar with it. In R2 is simply uh, twice the derivative with respect to x, twice the derivative with respect to y. I'm putting a minus sign in front because I'm asking the Laplace operator to be positive definite. It, on a compact manifold, the, so the Laplace operator is positive definite, elliptic, formally self-adjoint. And since the manifold is compact, its spectrum is going to be discrete. Um, so I'm going to be writing phi lambda for the eigenfunctions and lambda square for the eigenvalues. The operator is positive, so all the eigenvalues are positive. This is why I allow the square up on top of here. And so this notation will remain throughout my talk. And as the title says, I'm interested in the serial sets of these eigenfunctions. Uh, so the serial sets are simply the sets on the manifold, the set of points where the eigenfunctions vanish. You can think of them as the skeleton of your eigenfunctions. And from a quantum mechanics point of view, they are the set of points on the manifold where a um, quantum particle of energy lambda is least likely to be. And I am interested in the geometry of these null sets as the eigenvalue goes to infinity. So in my first slide, I'm showing you some pictures of zero sets of eigenfunctions. So on the top left, what you see is simply a quarter stadium, and all those lines inside of it are the serial sets of a high energy eigenfunction. Each time I say high energy, I mean lambda large. Um, here, you're seeing a vitreous on the serial set of an eigenfunction again. And in, at the bottom, what you're seeing is a square torus and a sphere. And in these two pictures, what you're seeing is in black, uh, you're seeing the set of points on the manifold where the eigenfunction is positive. In white, you're seeing those, po those places where the eigenfunction is negative. So naturally, the, set of the serial set in these two pictures are simply the lines separating the black and the white regions. What kind of boundary conditions do you have on that? On this one, uh, they are directed boundary conditions, I believe. There are pictures for both, I'm not sure. Yes, I think it's direct. Um, so I'm interested in the global geometry of this serial set as lambda goes to infinity. Uh, it can be proved that these lines are rectifiable, so you can speak about their length. And on compact real analytic surfaces, it has been shown that the length of these lines grows like lambda as lambda goes to infinity. This is a result by Donnelly and Pfefferman, the upper bound, and by Bruning, the lower bound. And this is true on again, analytic surfaces. Uh, if you put smooth manifolds, then this becomes much harder, and it's not known. Um, the bounds are not good. At um, so you could, aside from the length, you could ask how many um, connected components this serial set is defining. So in this next picture, you're seeing the, um, each connected component is shown with a different color, and you're just trying to count how many of them there are. And uh, this result is known as current null domain. The number of null domains for phi lambda is bounded above by lambda squared. Um, in full generality, you cannot hope to have a lower bound for this number. You could also ask how spread the serial sets are on the surface. And here, what I'm, uh, so what's known is that there exists a constant C, such that if you place a ball of radius C over lambda anywhere in your surface, then that ball is going to intersect the serial set for sure, no matter at which x you center the ball at. So this gives you a notion of how spread they are. And you could also ask how fat these connected components are. Uh, and this is a result about the inner radius. This was proved by Dan Mangubi and by Bruning. And on analytic surfaces, what's known is that the inner radius will decay like C over lambda as lambda goes to infinity. 
which simply means that uh, if, you, if you look at this lower bound, then you can always place a ball of radius little c over lambda in each of your nodal domains. So all of these are results about the global geometry of these zero sets. I am interested in what happens uh, if you want to look only at a piece of your surface, a local result. So one thing that you can do is to fix a curve, which I'm drawing in orange, uh, on the piece of the surface that you're looking at, and then let lambda go to infinity, and you're just looking at the zero set of your eigenfunction, and you just count how many intersections your serial sets with the curve has. And um, I'm hoping to get an upper bound for this number. Um, as lambda goes to infinity always. As lambda. So I would like to have an upper bound for this intersection. No, no, it will depend on h. h is fixed. Okay. So, uh, you cannot ask this question for any such age. Uh, it's not a well-posed question, actually. Uh, so there are examples on the sphere and on the torus of curves and infinite sequences of eigenfunctions that vanish completely along that curve, <coughs> which means that for those sequences, uh, for that choice of age, this number of intersections is going to be infinite, which means that you, of course, cannot hope to get an upper bound. So you need to get rid of these bad curves if you want to ask how this intersection is going to behave in general. So in order to do that, Seldich and Toff introduced the notion of what a good curve is. They said, OK, a good curve for my problem is going to be a curve for which I can find two constants, c and lambda 0, such that whenever I restrict my eigenfunction to the curve, the L2 norm of that restriction is going to be bounded below by an exponential function that it's decaying with lambda, as lambda goes to infinity. So what this condition is telling you is that you can allow your eigenfunctions to go to zero over your curve, but it cannot go, they cannot go to zero faster than a decaying exponential. And this condition turns out to be a very nice condition if you want to work uh, in understanding this number of intersections. And so what you should expect, mm, so conjecture, if you work with any surface which is smooth, then if H is good, then this should imply that the number of intersections of the serial set of your eigenfunction of eigenvalue lambda with your fixed curve h should be like O of lambda, big O of lambda. So it's decaying fast, uh, faster than c times lambda for some c fix as lambda goes to infinity. So this is what you should expect whenever your metric is smooth. I'm going to tell you what's known. Um, so Toth and Selich, who, as I was saying, introduced the concept of a curve being good, they were working on uh, regions in the plane. And in the plane, they were able to show that if the curve H is good, then you get this O of lambda bound, which I'm denoting by this double star over there. So this is for bounded regions in the plane. On the torus, Borgain and Rudnick 2010, they proved that if you choose your starting curve H to have strictly positive curvature, uh, then the curve H is going to be good. And also this O of lambda bound is going to be satisfied. So these are two flat examples. On uh, hyperbolic compact surfaces, Jung proved in 2011 that if you, the curve that you're fixing is a geodesic circle, then the geodesic circle is, is a good curve, and you also get this O of lambda bound. And in a bit, and in a more general case, if you ask your metric to be analytic, not smooth, but analytic, together with John Toth, we were able to prove that whenever you, are, you ask your curve H to be good, then it's going to satisfy the O of lambda bound. So all of these are very nice results. And if you look at the first one and the last one, <laughs> they are good, but you would like to be able to say when is it that a curve H satisfies. 
this condition, the goodness condition. Uh, so this is my last slide, and it's the problem which I, I'm the working on. Sharp. Sorry? The upper the one. Lambda. Yeah, it's sharp. That's the best you can hope for, yes. Are there any lower bounds too? Or? Yes, there are lower bounds on the torus. Uh, they are much harder to get. Barbogain and Rudnick, they prove uh, they get a lower bound if the curve H is strictly curved of the form lambda to the 1 minus epsilon. Um, yes, they are much harder to get. <coughs> yes, on the torus, flat torus. Um, so this is my last slide. Um, I'm going to try to explain you what I know so far of when a curve is, about when a curve is good or not. And it turns out that you need to understand the behavior of the normal derivative of your eigenfunction and the tangential derivative of your eigenfunction along the curve. Um, so let me explain you in which sense. It is possible to prove this lower bound here. You get a lower bound for the L2 norm of the restriction of phi lambda to the curve in terms of the L2 norm of the tangential derivative along the curve of your eigenfunction. So of course, if you were able to have an exponential lower bound for the tangential derivative, you would be done. You would get that the curve H is good in the sense of this definition. Now, um, that's, that's not easy to do. So suppose you say, OK, I'm going to try to involve the normal derivative here to have more information about how the eigenfunction is behaving close to my curve H. And then what you can do is to add the normal derivative of your eigenfunction uh, to that equation. And um, what you will get is actually the lower one that you were hoping for. But now, of course, you have this positive term here that it's bothering you and you cannot control. At this point, I will say that this lower one can be improved if you're working with quantum ergodic sequences of eigenfunctions, which I won't define what they are. But in that case, uh, this lower bound is improved to a constant. This is a result by Stasich, Toth, and Christensen. Um, so you can see right away that <laughs> the problem here is whenever this term that you have is large, large in the sense, for example, bigger than this constant, um, because you are not getting any information out of the norm of the restriction of your eigenfunction to the curve. So what I think one should be able to to prove, but haven't been able to do so so far, is that um, if you ask your curve H to be strictly, cur uh, to have strictly positive curvature, then uh, I, s I think that this normal derivative, as l if it is large, it should imply that the tangential derivative is at least uh, bigger than an exponential function that it's decaying with lambda. And uh, again, you should ask the curve H to be strictly curved. And uh, when I say large, I mean greater, for example, in the quantum ergodic case, I'm asking greater than some constant C. So th this condition should be true. Uh, it's hard to prove, though. Uh, but if the normal derivative is bounded below by a constant C, then of course, if the curve is positively curved, this tangential derivative shouldn't be smaller than an exponential function. Uh, so this is what I like working on, and this is what I am working on right now. Thank you.